Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And if you appreciate what we do here on Crucial Conversations and Crucial Productions, head on over to crucialproductions.org slash give. We'd appreciate any uh, gift of any amount that can uh, that you can give. That was awkward. But this part's not awkward. Make sure you're tithing to your church first. Your local congregation is much more important. If you have questions, because we're getting questions from people, which is awesome, and we're going to talk kind of about that today, send an email to questions at crucialproductions.org or head on over to the website again, crucialproductions.org, and go to the Ask a Question button. I I forgot how to do that part, Kevin. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's a button. But all that aside, now that we've got that out of the way, We're starting a new series for you here on Crucial Conversations on hermeneutics, which is, yeah, it's a fancy way of saying, how do we read the Bible? How do we understand the Bible? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And, you know, I I put out a tweet and a Facebook post last night, letting people know we're going to be doing this and kind of seeking interest. There's definitely some interest. And Kevin, one of the things I said is, it sounds like academic and technical, but it's actually really not. It's one of the most basic things we need as Christians is how to how to read and understand our Bible. The other thing I did not say on Facebook, which I think might help us get going on this series, is this is actually a very subtle um, discipline, uh, if I can use that word. I don't know if discipline a, is a good word for that. But subtle in the sense that it, how we understand the Bible can be so quickly and easily influenced by any number of other things other than scripture other than Jesus, other than the things that we're going to talk about. And so as we go through this series, one of the things that we'll be doing is kind of pointing out how a different hermeneutic, a different standard of interpretation may have come into play to get you where you're at on this particular issue. So we talked about critical theory and how that has influenced our culture today. That's, That's actually an example of a hermeneutic, how critical theory is used as a hermeneutic to understand the culture around us. And that's that understanding is then imposed upon the culture and drives everything, um, how you view everything about it. So this is why hermeneutics is important, uh, not only for the world around us, but especially for how we read and understand scripture. Uh, that's why this actually matters. So. Kevin, where where do we start with this? Where where's to get our brains in the right place? <laughs> where 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 do we get going with this? And does scripture actually tell us we should do this in some way that we actually should seek to understand it and there's a way to go about doing that? So the the answer to the the question where do we start is that we start with Christ. We start with Jesus as the actual revelation of God, and we're just gonna we're just gonna say some things very bluntly in this program, which which <laughs> we, not everybody we, would agree with. And we kind of <laughs> we kind of do that, which is but why we okay. want people to send in questions. Yeah, send in questions. Yeah, and the when you discuss hermeneutics, which is properly the study of the interpretation of things, or especially texts, biblical texts or other literary texts, um. You really can't approach a text without some kind of presupposition, which means some kind of thought that you bring to the to the text. And there's no now, such thing as a blank slate. Yeah, you like, can't. I, dis- I don't come to anything as a blank slate, just ready to be impressed upon. Never. And yeah. so the admitted presupposition, and we've said this many times in this podcast, the the admitted presupposition and the confessed presupposition that we all share is that the point of scripture is Christ, that he is the central theme of scripture, that he is the completion of the revelation of God, that he is God's definitive action to save mankind, that all of scripture is written to point to him, whether forward or backward, that he is the goal of the Christian life, that he is the head of the church, um, that he is God in the flesh. This is actually our hermeneutic, is that we read scripture focused on Christ. And we believe that because the scripture is focused on Christ, that the main theme of the Bible then is that God saves humanity by grace through faith because of what Christ has done. So as as 
a lot of Lutheran theologians have said in the past, those aren't two different themes. They are the same theme. Mm -hmm. Christ and justification by grace through faith is one theme in the scripture. And that actually is our hermeneutic. I hope you enjoyed the series. It was short. <laughs> But that's, that's I have all there a follow up is. question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I mean that's that's the thing. One one of the things that that I've that I see happen personally, um, and then with others around me is it's like okay, great, Kevin, that's that's nice for scripture. Great, we're gonna do a series on on how that fits scripture. But one of the things we're gonna do differently in this series is actually point out how this this hermeneutic for scripture. Is actually a hermeneutic for life. Um, that that this is actually the way to look at the world around us as well, um, and that's where this actually gets very interesting and where it gets more difficult, especially for somebody like myself when I realize, uh oh, I've been looking at something in a different way, maybe a non-Christian way, with something else as the focus other than Christ. Now I have to reorient my brain. And that can be painful. Uh, that can be hard to do, especially if I have any sort of um, pride or emotion invested in this other way of looking at the thing where I've got, there's something on the line, my reputation, um, my my standing within a social group or any, anything like that. It can be very difficult to reorient how I think if I have become so embedded in my, my identity in that other place according to the other hermeneutic. Um that was a very vague and yet specific way of talking about it. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. Um, but the main point being, this isn't just for the Bible. There's, there's a lot more to this whole way of looking at things. And that's one of, one of the reasons this is, this is going to be a series is beginning to unpack all those other things as well. And a lot of those other things will come in as examples. So as we're talking about how to read scripture... Uh, we'll we'll end up talking about critical theory again because critical theory is a hermeneutic that Christians end up picking up and imposing upon Scripture. And so we'll talk about it again in that context and say, hey, you're reading Scripture in a different way. Um, you're looking at life in a different way. You're you're approaching things in a different way other than through Christ and what He's done. Does that make sense, Kevin? So. We don't have an audience for me to say, hey, does that make sense, and get feedback. So I just have to ask you if it makes sense. So basically what, what Peter was waxing on, waxing poetically upon. Not eloquently, notion, for sure. Not eloquently, but, <laughs> but, but attempted at poetry. Um, is that I didn't mention the book, the Bible, when I talked about hermeneutics and starting oh, with Christ. You're right. And justification by grace through faith. Um, and that's actually a very important thing in this is that, and this might sound very strange, but again, try to, try to trust us and stick with us on this. Hold off on the pitchforks and torches. Yeah, please. <laughs> I mean, that they're welcome, but not quite yet. Um, and for other reasons, not, not what you're about to say. Yeah. Lutheran hermeneutics actually don't start with the physical book of the Bible. Hmm. And that's going to sound strange it actually doesn't start with the physical book that you're holding in front of you called the Bible. Um, it actually starts with Christ, who is truly God in the flesh, son of God, son of man, you know, son of Mary, son of God, crucified, risen, ascended, returning, the eternal judge. He is the one who is the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. That's our hermeneutic. And God, through the mercies of Jesus Christ, grants salvation freely to all people by grace through faith because of what Christ has done. Mm -hmm. That's our hermeneutic. Now, because the Bible is given to us by God as a revelation of this truth, this informs the way we read the Bible, certainly, maybe even primarily. <laughs> but as, as Peter is getting at, this hermeneutic actually explains to us how to see life. And not just life in a religious way, but life 
in reality, that this is actually the interpretive truth for existence. And that, that sounds pretty heavy. Okay. But, but that's actually what we're getting at, is that this hermeneutic is not just a tip on how to open your Bible and read it, which it is that. Mm -hmm. But it is also, how do you see life this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow morning? Okay, I think one of the first questions people might have is, if you can't start with the Bible, but the Bible is the only place where we actually learn about Jesus and who he is, how... How do you start with Jesus first when the only revelation of Jesus we have is the Bible? The Bible did not create God. So we don't start with the creation in order to get to the creator. We actually start with the creator as revealed to us through creation. Okay, and what's the substantive difference? So This is where it gets subtle. <laughs> so we don't start with the Bible to say it's the only way to learn about Jesus, and therefore I have to learn or know about Jesus before I can confess him. We don't actually believe that's the way it works. The scriptures are written to reveal to us who God is in Christ, and it's actually the Holy Spirit that teaches us to believe that or gives us faith to believe that. It's not that I have to intellectually learn it first and then come to some kind uh, of rational consent to yeah. where I can confess it. Um, and it's very simple for those of us who, who continue the orthodox, historical, traditional practice of infant baptism is that, you know, when I was at the baptism of your, of your daughter, Peter, mm -hmm. we, we didn't sit her down and read to her the four gospels first and say, now, do you get it? <laughs> okay, let's baptize you now. All right, Maggie, no, you're, not, you're a week old. How are you exactly, doing Exactly, you're a week yeah. old, you know. And we don't, that's not the way we do things. We don't start with the Bible as, as a collection of physical writings and then proceed to Christ. Okay. We actually start with Christ as God's definitive action to save my, mankind. We would start with the gifts given because of Christ and through Christ and believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit and that the scriptures are the infallible and inspired word of God. And therefore, when you read this, this text, we're reading the truth about Christ, but the, the scriptures don't establish Christ as truth. Christ yeah. establishes the scriptures. Part, part of this is our recognition of the Holy Spirit and, and his role in this, because we, we don't say that the Holy Spirit's gonna do something different than what scripture confesses the Holy Spirit's going to do. I mean, that's where we look to understand how does the Holy Spirit work. But the Holy Spirit isn't tied to that physical book as if he can only work if the physical book is present or understood properly. It, I don't, do you understand what I'm trying to get at here? Like, I, th I think part of this is we tie the Holy Spirit to your understanding of, of the physical book and he can't work apart from that. No, we confess that the Holy Spirit can do what he's going to do, and what he's going to do is work faith and confess Christ to you. The reason we know that is because that's what Scripture confesses, but that doesn't tie him to Scripture in that sense. So I, I'm, I'm trying to work my own mental right, <laughs> my own mental so, way through this as we podcast. Isn't that fun? So we, we really don't. What part of our hermeneutic is, and it, this might sound a little strange again for talking about a method of reading or interpretation, but part of our hermeneutic is that it's, it's not an intellectual hermeneutic. It actually is a spiritual hermeneutic. We believe that this is of the spirit. This is not um, an academic exercise. And, and we will definitely cover a lot of academic exercises in this series because hermeneutics... Um, always gets tied up in academia and, and the, the reigning philosophy of the day, um, textual theories, reading theories, linguistic theories, um, epistemology, you, you start throwing big words at it and <laughs> it influences hermeneutics. Literally it does. Um, it's big words always even, influence other big words. Even small words influence hermeneutics. Um, yeah. In, and presuppositions that we share as Americans, definitely influence the way we read the Bible. And yet those presuppositions are not shared by Christians in other nations. And so that should give us at least some pause as to whether or not that's a valid way to read the Bible. If, if I'm looking at this book, 
which is the inspired word of God, which proclaims Christ, and I'm reading it with a, a presupposition or an assumption that is not shared by my brothers and sisters in Christ in a different location or a different time, then that might make me or encourage me to reevaluate that interpretation. So a quick and quick and easy example for this would be reading the book of Revelation and saying that the swarms of locusts is clearly Black Hawk helicopters. It has to be. I mean, that... Because that's what I see in my experience as things that are flying that are black and swarming. Yeah. And (laughs) therefore, that's what John meant in the first century. Oh, wait. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, basically what we're saying is you can't read Scripture in such a way that other people in different times and different places can't understand it in the same way. Yeah, it doesn't make any... Well, and it doesn't make any sense to the original... Those, those would be audience. other times, yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that, be other times meaning, yeah. Like Previous historical. People have been reading this book for 2,000 years, and all of a sudden it only applies to my life today. That's That r- right away can't be a good hermeneutic. <laughs> or suddenly so, America so is the, the promised land like you get in Mormonism We're skipping tons of issues. I know. So, <laughs> so all these things are really... And, and, and I'm not, I wasn't, I was kidding in the beginning, but I'm also not, is that go back and listen to the first five minutes and we're done because that actually is all there is. You, <laughs> all these other things we're going to discuss are simply explaining what those things mean. And then also explaining how we how, actually do that, how that central idea of reading Christ, him crucified and justification by grace through faith, how, how that hermeneutic actually helps us to avoid the errors of other hermeneutics that are going to creep in sometimes kind of like ninjas, they're going to sneak in. We don't even see them coming. <laughs> yeah. right? And then all of a sudden they got us and we don't even realize that we were influenced by these things. Um, if you want a contemporary example, we just did one on critical theory and how critical theory has kind of come in and, and changed the way the scriptures have been read by the church in, in, in recent history. So that all of a sudden here's a hermeneutic that's sneaking into the church. It sounds good on some, some level, it sounds even Bible-y sometimes. So we find common words in the Bible, common words in this new way to look at life, and we say, ooh, maybe that's what the Bible means. And and I'm not putting that down. That's what people have done since the Bible was first given to us, is is we look at these, these words. Because even though we don't start with a physical Bible, the reality is I'm actually sitting here in front of a Bible. Yeah. So, when, so primarily, when we're talking about a hermeneutic, we are thinking about reading the Bible, and 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 again, there there's lots of issues even in in what the Bible is and what that means. But for for our conversations, we're going to assume that when we say the Bible, we all mean the same sixty six books that we have, thirty nine books of the Old Testament, twenty seven of the New Testament, um, bound together in this book. Um, I'm looking at the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. Um, so we're assuming you're looking at a a reputable translation, like the new King James or the King. And I know there's issues. Don't, don't write in and say, (laughs) you said this. Oh no. I know. But basically a reputable translation, meaning it's been translated by a committee of people who know what they're doing based on the Greek and Hebrew text. Um, it has been accepted at least in some way by the church and it's not, some fringe translation or interpretation like the message or the living Bible or those kinds of things where it really is not an accepted translation. So if you're looking at an actual translation of the Bible, um, an English translation, that's kind of what we mean when we say Bible most times is that we're looking at this book that we kind of all share. You Obviously in today's world, physical book is even anachronistic. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You could be looking at your phone as it's scrolling through. You could look it online. That's fine. That all works. Pretty much, though, if you type in the Holy Bible, you're going to get the same 66 books from Genesis to Revelation um, in two testaments. So that's that's easy. So when we say Bible, don't worry about it. We might do one on canon and how we got the canon and what is the canon and Lutheran view of canon and all that kind of stuff. Canon is not something you shoot at your enemies. It's actually a measuring line, but that's okay. <laughs> and, and, we, and we've talked about maybe doing something on the Apocrypha with a guest. Right. We can do. We have a friend who likes to get animated about that. So we, yes, very much so. <laughs> and so CPH we can even published that. the apocrypha, so we can talk yeah, about that with um, Lutheran study notes, and that's so, fun. Yeah. So there's there's lots to talk about when it comes to even talking about the Bible. 
Um, but but we're really going to concentrate on hermeneutics first, and then allow that to bring us into the scriptures as as a physical book and the and the things that are revolve around that. So as we talk about hermeneutics, the reason this is important is because um, humans after the fall into sin no longer have immediate and constant access to God. And I know that's going to sound strange, but we no longer have immediate, meaning direct, and constant access to God in the flesh, walking around telling us what to do. It seems like Adam and Eve might have had some kind of immediate and constant contact with God. Wait, wait, are you saying I I can't walk in the garden alone and he walks with me and talks with me? Well, he, 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 that's, that's a hermeneutic is that he walks with me and talks with me. And so we're going to see, and that's, that's the other thing is a lot of the hermeneutics um, that we're going to talk about are preserved in song. They're preserved in, in uh, Christian bookstore posters. Um, Funeral sermons is where you hear a lot of people's hermeneutics kind of being exposed. Yeah. Um, good friend of mine just had a death in the family. And when people say things to comfort, a lot of people's hermeneutics get exposed at the time. And you kind of, hmm. Okay. Or in a really good way, you see a lot of people talking about Christ and his resurrection. And that's really our comfort. And you say, oh, wow, that's a good hermeneutic. When, when the yeah. chips are down, where are we going to look? We look to Christ. And that's, that's something we would say, yeah, that's great. That's what we want to do. So, when we talk about hermeneutics, yes, it is. We are going to do a lot of talk about how to read the Bible. And hopefully that'll be something we do right away is, okay, I want to read the Bible. How do we do that? Um, hopefully we're going to publish some other resources on that at Crucial Productions as well. But <laughs> but um, part I need of a study series, guide, Kevin. Once yes. I get a study guide, we can do some exactly. of them. <laughs> part, of, part of this... <laughs> <laughs> Part of this little series is going to be on how do you read your Bible. But but the reason we're saying all this is I encourage you to see it more than just how do I physically open my Bible and read it. It actually is the way that we see existence. We see it primarily through God's action in Christ to reconcile the world into himself. We see it primarily through Christ as God in the flesh. We see it primarily through Christ as as the propitiation for our sins, the one that forgives sins. We see life through, primarily through God's action to save mankind as a gracious act that we receive by faith because of what Christ has done. This is our hermeneutic, not just for the Bible, but this is our hermeneutic for life. This is our hermeneutic for how we conceive of humanity, how we conceive of God, how we conceive of this world. And so as we begin this this little series which is getting bigger and bigger as we talk <laughs> um we encourage you to to follow along to ask questions and and to try some things so one of the things i really encourage people to try with me this is my daily task is to learn to see the world the way that god sees the world in the sending of his son so the text that we all know from the bible is God so loved the world, right? Mm-hmm. John three sixteen. So what does it mean to love the world that way? What does it mean that God loves the world that way? And then how do we, how does that change or how does that help us process or how does that reveal to us who God is, who the world is, what God's action is? And then the amazing thing in that verse is whosoever believes. And all of a sudden, maybe even I'm included in this story. Hmm. What if I believe this? What happens? You get eternal life. Well, now, now this, this amazingly theological and giant text, right? For God, I mean, that's a concept. You could literally talk about the rest of existence and not get to it, right? I mean, like (laughs) literally, you could just talk about God the rest of your life and never get right or get the whole thing covered. So now we've got God, who that's huge, the world, which in Greek is the cosmos. So it's all of existence right? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we have God loving the world. Those are huge concepts that he gave his only son. And then all of a sudden, whoever believes now, all of a sudden it's me, it's you, it's a person, it's, it's the church, it's humans involved. And this giant cosmic reality all of a sudden becomes important in your life. Mm. Why? Because God gave. And the result of that, if you believe that, 
you get life. And now this is not just practical as in I'm included, you're included, the world is included, but every single person who faces death, there's now a promise for them that there's a way to live. There is a way to live eternally. And it's only in Christ. So this this sounds like a wonderful homily, lecture, Bible study, teaching. When, when I hear you talk like that, I don't think hermeneutic. I just think, oh, this is an inspiring thing to help me I mean, maybe that's all that maybe that is what it is. Help me reorient my thinking. Okay, so I'm going to go out, but I know within a couple hours or a couple days, I'm going to forget that. And it's like, okay, I need I need a reminder because I started thinking that way and then I forgot how to do it again. Um, is, is that all we're doing here? Is it is it simply that that reminder? How do we take something like this and make it, I don't know, stick? Yeah, this is. <laughs> So this is actually part of sanctification. When we talk in the in Lutheran circles about justification is how you're saved, and then sanctification is how do you live now that you're saved, or how do you live as the as a child of God? How do you live as a member of the church? How does the church live out its faith? Mm-hmm. Um, sanctification involves this this changing of the mind to interpret the world, to interpret existence in a Christological way, in a Christ centered way, in a grace oriented way, so that you're right. You'll forget this. You'll get distracted. I'll get distracted. I'll be tempted to interpret the world differently. Um, I'm, I'm especially tempted to interpret the world differently when it doesn't go how I think God ought to run the world. Yeah. (laughs) So I got it licked. I got it figured out and I've got my role. God's got his role. I'm pretty good at my role. He's supposed to be pretty good at his role. And then all of a sudden he doesn't do his role the way I think he ought to do his role. Right. Mm-hmm. the person I think should get blessed doesn't get blessed. And the person I'm pretty sure should get cursed doesn't get cursed. And now I'm saying to God, what are you doing? <laughs> and pretty soon my hermeneutic is gone, right? Cause my hermeneutic yeah. has gone from God in Christ to Kevin's interpretation of life. And God is subject to that. And, and that seems silly and it might even seem crass, but, but in a lot of ways, this is our struggle is that I, I've, I've met very few Christians who would disagree with Christ being the center? Most of them say, right. "Yeah, yeah, that's 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 right. It's got to be right." Obviously, I mean, the Bible's about Jesus. Obviously, yeah. it's about Jesus in some way. Yeah, maybe they don't agree how her pervasive I would make it, but but they they would say in some way Jesus has got to be number one, right? I mean, even if you're making your list of ten priorities in life, Jesus has got to be number one, right? I mean, even if it's just out of piety's sake, you got to say that, <laughs> right? So so nobody's going to disagree with you to your face, like, "Oh, I think we should read the Bible because it's about Jesus." They'd be like. Well, duh. You know, that's like saying eating is about food. Like, duh. I mean, that that's just duh. But but then you say, okay, now go, now read every word of the Bible focused on Christ. And they go, whoa, that's, that's going to be a little different. You mean like, so I'm reading Leviticus, it's about Jesus? Yes, that's what we're yeah. saying. And then when you close your Bible and you go to the store to get groceries, focus on Christ. Do that because of Christ crucified. See your entire life as God's grace for you in Christ Jesus. See every person that you see as one for whom Christ has died. See every gift you have received as the result of God's gracious action on your behalf because of Christ's death and resurrection. See every occurrence in your life as not God failing to do his job, but as God blessing you in Christ even when you suffer. See, every action of yours is an opportunity to repent and to receive forgiveness. I mean, not not that everything we talk about has to be immediately practical and it's only valued because it's immediately practical and I can apply to my life. But as, as you're talking through this and I'm thinking through the things that we're going to cover, one of the reasons this hermeneutic is so essential and important is because it does explain so many things. You can read judges and and God wiping people out and telling people to to be killed and got to get rid of them. Joshua, that's there's a pretty mm-hmm. big one. Go wipe out the mm-hmm. whole nations. And if you forget that this is actually about Jesus in some way and that it's pointing people to Christ, 
those those it just seems like violence for the sake of violence. God's just angry. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. If if you look at the world around you and there are you know, children in cages at the border, and there's riots downtown, and you forget that Jesus is actually the answer to all of that. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to become consumed by the overwhelming, the, the overwhelmingness of, of the problem and, and how to solve it and how to fix it. If you forget that Jesus is already the answer and learning to reorient your thinking around that or having, uh, having the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit, please reorient my thinking. Right. I can't wrap my brain around this. I'm, it's not working. How is this actually about Jesus? What is, what is the answer to this in Christ? And mm -hmm. help me learn to see it in that way. So we do that with scripture. We do that with our current events. I mean, Kevin, you had to do this with me with COVID and needing to wear a mask at church now. Mm -hmm. It's like reorient my brain because all I can focus on is the fact that I have to wear a mask in church mm -hmm. and that my pastor is now going to serve me the sacrament while wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And to me, all that says is you should be afraid when you come up to the Lord's table. And I know that that's theologically wrong. Right. <laughs> that, that isn't yep. what we're saying. And yet, what we're saying. Even, even in that, okay, how, how do I reorient my thinking around this difficult thing that I have in my life that I know is supposed to be about Christ, now appears mm -hmm. to be some, about something else, but there is a way to see this as about Christ as well. I mean, th this is where seeing the world the way God sees it mm -hmm. actually matters and makes a difference. Um, let's go, like we talk about God's law. It's his will. Mm -hmm. Look, mm -hmm. it's, if, if we got to see the world the way God sees it, well, that's just the right way to see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that's the blessing of starting with Christ is that, I mean, it's the truth, which is why we do it. We're not doing it because we get some kind of benefit from it. It's, it's actually because it's the truth. It, it is the truth of all existence is Christ. Yeah, I'm, I'm still wearing a mask at church. Yeah. And, <sighs> and the reason that we can rejoice in this being the truth is because God desires for us to be saved. He loves us. He's gracious. Now, remember, he's not obligated to any of that. That's yeah. actually his character that we learn about through Christ. And this is why this hermeneutic of reading God's word, understanding reality through God's action in Christ to save is ends up being such a magnificent thing because it reveals the truth of who God is. And that truth is that God loves, which is, sounds trite because we've made it such an, an a presupposition. We've actually made that a presupposition that God Yeah, we've actually made that the hermen a hermeneutic in some right. cases. Which is kind of strange. Um, <laughs> like I said, I, I think the most tempting thing in for sinners is to believe that God is somehow submitting his employee review form to me. <laughs> Um, you know, that he's like, okay, here's what I've done the last month. How did I do? Kevin, I go, on a scale of one to five, can you please evaluate yeah. me? And can you evaluate show me where I, where do I need and, improvement? And we kind of say, well, what God, goals well, should I set right. for the I next mean, review? Think about this. You guys actually do this. I know you do because I've, I do it too. Is you say, okay, your goal is to save everyone. Right. For this is good. And please is God, our savior who desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. And we say, okay. Let's see how you're doing. <laughs> and then our conclusion is, you're not doing very well. Yeah, not everybody's being saved. Yeah. As a matter of fact, most people aren't being saved. And so we kind of go, well, a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. <laughs> and what we've done is we've actually, we've actually not read the scriptures focused on God's action in Christ. We've now read the scriptures based on our evaluation of God's ability to do his job. Which is partly when when I bring up Joshua and Judges and mm -hmm. the and the situations exactly there. Right. I mean that that's what we're doing. It's like whoa, hold on. First John tells me God is love. That that well, there's nothing loving going right. on there. He's just you saying wipe everybody that. out. Yeah. So and part uh, maybe another way to talk about the hermeneutic is what's your starting point? Where where do you start as you're trying to think about Scripture and understand it or think about the world around you? What's what's the point at which you start and say okay, everything flows from this. 
We've talked about that as a presupposition. Maybe a starting point is another way. What? How does? How does it? Where does it go from here? So the problem with thinking of a starting point, and, and we will get to a priori and a posteriori. Um, oh, now we're thoughts. bringing in Latin. Yeah. Wow. Because it actually. What do you start with, and what do you look back from? Right. We you, are hoity-toity in this what one. What do you start and look forward to? That's kind of <laughs> a priori. You're starting from the beginning and looking forward, right? Okay. And then, and then a posteriori is what are you looking from the back? You're looking backwards, right? So you start at the end. And you kind of look back and say, what do we? What do we learn from the conclusion? And so what we so, have learned apply. Oh, sorry. Exactly. Let's, so I hope we don't get copyright dinged for that one. When we, yeah, <laughs> we will talk about that, but I hesitate to agree that Jesus is our starting point. Okay. Because, because a lot of people who say that then leave him at the beginning and uh, move on to something else. Yeah. So okay. I can see if that. he's our starting point, he's also equally or even more so the goal. And again, we get this from scripture itself. Hebrews 12 verse two says that Jesus is the beginning and the goal mm-hmm. of our faith of all things, right? He, that's who Jesus is. He's the beginning and the goal. So um, we don't want to just leave Jesus at the beginning and say, well, we started with Jesus and then we got somewhere else. You want to start with Jesus. You want to walk with Jesus and you want to end with Jesus. You, you want to learn to, to read the scriptures in Christ as focused on Christ, as leading towards Christ, as proclaiming Christ, as reflecting Christ, as exalting Christ, as defining Christ, as proclaiming Christ. You also want to learn to see your entire life under the Lordship of Christ, that there is nothing that is outside of his control. And we'll get to the that's actually in the Bible. Don't worry. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. I keep saying this. We'll get to that. So, yeah. so as you can see, this is this is a general overview of, of hermeneutics. We will start digging into these topics. Um, we encourage you to to kind of say, "Huh, I've always been wondering about this," or "I struggle with that." So, so bring those with us. Peter will tell you a little bit more how to do that and that kind of stuff. Got more more questions? Yeah. So just to just to wrap up our our episode today. I did think of one example of what could happen if you say Jesus is a starting point. If only because I could see just with our recent example of critical theory, how a Christian holding to critical theory can say, well, yeah, Jesus is my starting point. And so I'm starting with Jesus dying to redeem the world. And critical theory uses redemption language and oppression language. And that's very similar. And so because I started with Jesus, and thinking through, well, yeah, the, the redemption and freeing freeing people from slavery, from oppression. I started there, so it, it's really okay wherever I end up, because that was that was my starting point. So I think that's a that's a decent con maybe a concrete example of mm-hmm. what that actually looks like. It's, it's so because I think very often we might get accused of saying, well, because we talk about other denominations being Christians, legitimately Christians, and people might hear us saying, well, therefore, anything they say goes. No, this is actually part of what we're talking about this whole way is that there are, just starting with Jesus isn't enough. I'll just leave it at that for now. And <laughs> like I think the other, way that it, the other way that it manifests itself, maybe maybe less explicitly, but sounds more Christian-y, is, is um, okay, I understand that I'm saved. Now let's got let's get on to the practical stuff. Yeah. How do I live that out? What am I supposed to do? And so we say, yeah, that's right. Well, we got Christ crucified. We proclaim that. Now let's get on to the stuff that really matters in my life today. Yeah. I've heard that from the pulpit in my life. Uh-huh. We all we're, everybody here understands Christ crucified, so we don't need to go over that again. Yeah. We got that. We're good. Let's go on to how this text actually affects your life. Yeah. And and that's a hermeneutic that is actually very scary. Um we're removing Christ and putting us as the key. And that's that's the number one hermeneutic that we're going to always be warning against is the hermeneutic to put yourself as the focus and to move Christ off the center. Yeah, because the crucial conversation is Christ crucified for sinners. Not it's not about us. So as we, that's all we got for you today as we, as we wrap up our 
introductory overview. Like Kevin said, if you want to send in questions, please feel free. Uh, we've got our Facebook group, The Grok Moots. Make sure you answer all three questions if you're trying to get in there because I, I want to make sure that you're not a spam person and that you legitimately want to be there when you uh, try and join. So there are three questions that you got to answer to get in there. You can post your questions there. You can send them to our Facebook page, Crucial Productions. You can find us on Facebook. Send an email, questions at crucialproductions.org. Go to the website, crucialproductions.org, and click the Ask a Question button there at the top. Fill out the form, send it in. All great ways to to interact with us. Uh, we also post our podcast on YouTube, uh, audio only, because we're not recording video at this point. But you can post a comment there, and we'll do our best to answer it there as well. So anything else to add, Kevin? Nope, sounds good. There's lots of ways to contact us. You yes. have no excuse. We have all the ways. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time. See ya. <laughs>